Hello, everybody. It's my great pleasure to be here um, talking about monarchs. Uh, normally, I talk a lot about monarch conservation or pollinator conservation and practical things that you can do to help monarchs. That's not what I'm doing today so much. Today, a heavy focus on the biology of monarchs, uh, which is a fun twist for me because they're just such cool critters. Uh, and, and here I go. I'm going to start. Uh, one reason to talk about monarchs is because they're fantastically beautiful. Uh, they're probably the most loved butterfly uh, in America, and, and certainly that, that color combination of the black and the dark orange and the sort of peach with the white polka dots is really iconic. Uh, I think when people think of butterflies, they usually think of the monarch. Um, so uh, it's cool. Gives me it's a great honor for me to work on the species and to work on conserving the species. Another um, awesome thing about monarch biology is that monarchs have co-evolved with their host plants, uh, milkweeds, uh, for instance, and, and we'll be talking about that more in detail in a few minutes. Monarchs are very famous because their chemical defenses against predators are very well understood. These are photos taken by my former boss, Professor Lincoln Brower, uh, decades ago. Um, what you see here is a blue jay uh, eating a monarch. That's, you see it on the left, eating part of the wing. And then on the right, you see the blue jay vomiting. Why? Because the monarch has chemical defenses that makes it taste yucky, that make the, the blue jay let it go. Uh, now this monarch probably died anyway, but, um, but um, yeah, out in the field, that can save the life of monarchs sometimes, having those chemical defenses. Mimicry, monarchs are a wonderful example of mimicry, their main mimic being the viceroy, and we'll talk about that in a little bit of detail in a few minutes. But the big focus of this talk is the amazing migration, well, really the amazing migrations of the monarch butterfly, because they don't just move at one time of the year, they move at multiple times of the year. Uh, in multiple generations. So we're gonna be talking about quite a bit about monarch migration um, and where they end up uh, in the migration, which is usually in spectacular overwintering colonies. Uh, these trees that you see here are absolutely covered with monarchs. And I've happened to, I've been to this place and it was uh, probably the most beautiful place in the world. So I'll be talking about that a little bit more, but really focusing more on the migratory pathways. Uh, another shot of, of the overwintering colony in Mexico. Uh, on the colder, cloudier days, the monarchs stay huddled uh, on the trees. On the brighter, warmer days, uh, they fly quite a bit. And it's, it's really wonderful to see. Um, monarchs can occur in any county in the lower 48 plus uh, parts of Hawaii. I'm not sure which Hawaiian islands monarchs have been found on. Uh, they got there, I think, um, uh, over 100 years ago. Um, don't know how they got there. I think humans probably took them over. But uh, yes, here in the lower 48, monarchs can be found in uh, any county, and they can be found in much of southern Canada. Monarchs in North America are thought of as having three different populations, uh, a population uh, west of the Rocky Mountains, a population east of the Rocky Mountains, in a population in South Florida. Um, that population west of the Rocky Mountains is called, oddly enough, the Western population. Uh, it breeds in various Western states in the spring and summer. And then in the winter, they head to the California coast and spend the winter there. The Eastern population, east of the Rocky Mountains, of course, breeds uh, in all of the states and provinces east of the Rocky Mountains. Um, and then they migrate in the fall to the mountains of central Mexico. And once again, there is thought that there is a non-migratory population in Florida, but I think I might talk about that a little bit later. <laughs> so how are monarchs doing? Uh, <laughs> excuse me, that's, that's from, from now on, the rest of the talk, we're gonna focus on the Eastern population, not talk much about the West at all. 
the Eastern population had a massive decline, uh, as you can see here, from the 90s to 2013. Uh, in the mid 90s, I had the opportunity to go to the overwintering colonies in Mexico, and I turned it down because I was too cheap. Big mistake. If I had gone then, I would have seen uh, monarchs at the highest levels that we have ever known. Now, by the way, nobody was counting them uh, before the 1990s. Uh, but our presumption is they were even more abundant in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, and then there was a major, major decline. <clears throat> and since the nadir of that decline in, in uh, the winter of 2013, 2014, <clears throat> excuse me, um, there has been, monarchs have been hovering at, a, at fairly low levels. Obviously, there was one year a good deal better than the others, uh, but most of the other years have been much lower than, than their abundances in the 90s. <laughs> now, you may be wondering, how do they count the monarchs in Mexico? Well, they don't. These bars are a surrogate measure for the count of butterflies. <laughs> it would be very difficult to count the number of monarch butterflies. So instead, what they do is they estimate the number of hectares of forest that are covered with butterflies. And once they have that um, mm -hmm. number of hectares, somebody has estimated that per each hectare, there's, let's say, 50 million monarchs. So in this winter, uh, back in the 90s, there were close to 1 billion monarchs in Mexico, they estimate. But again, each year, they're not counting all the monarchs in Mexico. They're estimating uh, the amount of um, area covered by monarchs. <laughs> Excuse me, I've had a nasty cough for two months, and it seems like it's not going to go away. Okay, now I will begin a section that I call Monarch Biology Basics. First off, of course, very elementary for some of you, the life cycle. Monarchs, like all butterflies, have four stages of their life cycle. The egg stage, the larval or caterpillar stage, the chrysalis stage, and the adult. One, two, three, four. And then of course the adults lay eggs, the adult females, and that gives rise to the cycle once again. We're gonna uh, talk a little bit about each of these uh, stages in a little more detail. <coughs> the eggs, what do they look like? Well, they're tiny, way smaller than a grain of rice. Uh, you can see them right there on the underside of, an, of a leaf. And they are very bright white. Uh, and they sort of look like, they're shaped like footballs, like little footballs. Uh, and if you looked at them under the microscope, they would be covered with rows of beautiful little dots beautiful little indentations. Uh, again, very tiny, bright white little eggs. The egg stage lasts for three to five days. Uh, out hatches a little caterpillar. That caterpillar immediately, well, almost immediately starts eating milkweed. <clears throat> and then eventually it gets too big for its skin and it sheds its skin and it becomes a second stage caterpillar called a second instar. And then that one eats and becomes too big and becomes a third in star and so on and so forth until you get a big, uh, quite chubby caterpillar, a fifth in star monarch caterpillar. This is about as big as a monarch caterpillar gets. Um, and then uh, after they've gotten to their maximal size, they wander off somewhere and hook themselves underneath a surface and form a pupa or chrysalis. Oh, forgot, I got a couple slides uh, to show you about caterpillars. On the left, we've got a monarch. On the right, we've got a black swallowtail. Just wanna remind folks that identifying these guys isn't the easiest thing in the world. Many, many people confuse the caterpillar on the right for the caterpillar on the left. That's happened many times. People will call me up and say, Ray, I've got a monarch caterpillar on my dill plants or on my carrot plant. I'm like, that's not a monarch, that's a black swallowtail because black swallowtail cat, black swallowtail caterpillars eat dill and carrot and other plants in that family. Uh, here's another look alike. The butterfly on the right is the queen butterfly caterpillar. Queens are very closely related to monarchs, but what's the difference? Both monarchs and queens have those long, uh, the, those long structures sticking out called tubercles. <coughs> 
But if you look carefully, you see the monarch on the left only has two pairs of tubercles. The queen caterpillar on the right has, uh, has three pairs. Okay, um, after 10 to 12 days, that monarch caterpillar uh, pupates <coughs> into the beautiful green chrysalis that you see there. Uh, in this case, this is one that pupated on a, on a cattail that was reaching out over our pond um, here on our farm. The pupal stage usually lasts about uh, 10 to 15 days. And then a beautiful butterfly, a beautiful adult emerges. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm gonna get a drink. Clearly necessary. <laughs> For every 100 monarch eggs that are laid, how many survive to become adult monarchs? This is a grim statistic. And I actually flashed the number accidentally a few slides ago. The number is one. For every 100 monarch eggs laid, only on average, only one survives to an adulthood. Why? Because there are so many things out to get monarch eggs, caterpillars, and pupae, including predators like these shown here, um, now, the tachinid fly technically isn't a predator. I made a mistake by putting it, calling it that. Tachinid flies, which we have a lot of we're on the farm where I live here in Oklahoma, they lay their egg on um, monarch caterpillars. And the egg, the fly egg hatches and into a maggot and burrows inside the caterpillar and eats it out from the inside, whether and kills it, either in the caterpillar stage or in the pupil stage. Uh, pretty nasty. Uh, the wasp shown that more truly is a predator because they they at, um, they attack and kill uh, eggs, larvae, and pupae, and ants can be predators. Uh, I was going to talk more about uh, threats to monarchs, but I realized I can't talk about everything. So I'm going to direct you, if you want to learn more about predators, parasites, and disease, uh, diseases of monarchs, to this fantastic webinar uh, which by Dr. Karen Al Oberhauser and Dr. Sonia Altizer, one of the best ever webinars I've ever seen, <clears throat> heavily, totally focused on predators, parasites, and disease. And it's available at the Monarch Joint Venture website. Um, uh, just do a Google search for Monarchs in a Web of Life to find that terrific webinar. I, I, I learned a lot for, by seeing that for sure. So of course, adult. If those eggs, larvae, and pupae survive and become adults, the main job of the adults is to mate, uh, and then for the females to lay eggs. I want to talk a little bit about monarch ecology. Monarchs are generalists regarding habitat, as long as it's fairly open. As you see on the upper left, we've got prairie. Uh, just to the right of it, we've got some savanna here. Uh, I'm showing a pasture in the upper right that is a crop field. Occasionally, crop fields still have milkweeds in them. And the lower left is a open pine forest. Uh, the only habitat here that is sort of dense is this swamp down here. And you can find milkwe uh, milkweeds and monarchs in swamps, but usually monarchs are in the open habitats because that's where the sun is, that's where the milkweeds are, that's where the nectar plants are. Even though they're habitat generalists, they're host plant specialists. Their caterpillars only feed on milkweeds. Milkweeds, of course, are named for the milky sap. That milky sap is a physical defense that the plant has. <clears throat> the milky sap is full of uh, chemicals that make it very, very sticky. And so if a monarch caterpillar bites into that leaf in the wrong way, its, its mandibles, its mouth parts, can quickly get gummed up by the sticky sap, by the latex, by the latex molecules in the sap. So, so monarch caterpillars have uh, developed special techniques for cutting the leaf to try uh, cutting the leaf before they eat to try to get the sap to drip out. So that's a, a, a neat strategy to evade that physical defense. <clears throat> Milkweeds are also known for their chemical defenses. They have 
chemicals called cardiac glycosides, also known as cardenolides. And what you see here is a, a general structural formula that you write. You might remember what those were from your days in chemistry class or organic chemistry class uh, many years ago. Uh, it was many years ago for me. Uh, these cardiac glycosides are toxic to most vertebrates. They're toxic to a lot of invertebrates too. They're certainly toxic to humans. Um, so when milkweed leaves have cardiac glycosides, that makes them less likely to get eaten. Very importantly, because I don't talk much about this later, I've given whole talks on this before. Um, not all milkweeds have cardiac glycosides, but again, we won't, we won't go into much detail on that now. Remember the slide from earlier with the, with the blue jay vomiting? That is because the monarch was poisonous. Why was the monarch poisonous? Because the monarch had eaten poisonous milkweeds as a caterpillar, and the caterpillar sequestered the cardiac glycosides within its tissues, and they remained inside the caterpillar and the pupa and, and the adult. So there's this wonderful system. These plants evolved cardiac glycosides to protect themselves from getting eaten. Monarchs figured out not only how to eat toxic milkweeds, but how to take those chemicals and use those chemicals to protect themselves from predators. Very amazing strategy. <laughs> Monarchs are a very famous example of mimicry. Historically, it was thought that the viceroy shown on the left was a Batesian mimic, uh, named after uh, a scientist named Bates. A Batesian mimic is a butterfly that is not toxic, but has evolved to look like a toxic butterfly. So decades ago, 50 years ago, it was thought that monarchs were toxic and that viceroys were not. Well, it turns out uh, research has been done since then, uh, I think primarily by, I believe, David Ritland at the University of Florida, along with Lincoln Brower, and they discovered that viceroys are toxic also. Uh, and so it seems that the viceroys um, and the monarchs are benefiting by looking, by resembling one another. Uh, since, in, in other words, predators learn to avoid black and orange butterflies because these black and orange butterflies tend to be poisonous. And not only are they poisonous, they taste bad. Not all poisons taste bad. Cardiac glycosides are said to taste very, very bitter. And the birds can taste that and usually let them go. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna geek out on milkweeds. It's one of my favorite topics. How many species of milkweeds are there in the US? Three? Eight, 27, 52, more than 100? That seems like an awful lot. Well, the answer is more than 100, which makes it a really rich field of research. <clears throat> there are more <clears throat> than 100 milkweeds, and monarchs have been found to use at least 70 of them. It's possible that they use all of them as host plants but we haven't spent the time testing them all yet. But many, many dozens of them are good host plants for the monarch. <clears throat> what native plant genus do monarch larvae eat? If you know scientific names of plants, you can get this one. And I'd expect uh, most folks would say, A, Asclepius. And they do eat Asclepius, but in truth, they eat all of the genera listed here. Um, Asclepias are the standard milkweeds that are typically upright plants. All of these other plant genera are vines. These do not occur across the country. Um, <clears throat> they're prim primarily in the southern half of the US and especially in the southeastern US uh, where all of these can be found. And monarchs do use all of these as host plants. And here are some photos of some uh, milkweed genera. We've got Asclepias, the famous one. Uh, but Sinancum, shown here, uh, Matilia, <clears throat> comes in various colors, but it's a vine. Gonolobus, Funastrum, and Petalius are all vines. And I had the pleasure of starting to work on all of these 
way back in uh, summer of 93, uh, doing field work in, in Florida. Now to talk about really commonly used milkweeds by the Eastern population. And the milkweed that they use most commonly is common milkweed, Asclepias syriaca. This is the most abundant milkweed in the Northern states from North Dakota uh, to Kansas, uh, all the way over to say maybe North Carolina and up to Maine. This plant is really, really abundant and uh, not as abundant as it used to be, but much more abundant than any other milkweed in that part of the country. And it can form large colonies. And there's uh, when you have a colony like this, there's plenty of food for a monarch caterpillar. <clears throat> Another abundant uh, milkweed up north, it does occur down south, but not abundant down there, is swamp milkweed, Asclepius incarnata. A really easy one to grow in gardens, very pretty. Um, I strongly recommend it. Uh, to plant in your garden, any just about anywhere in the eastern half of the U.S. Now here is a southern milkweed. It does a few of them make it up to the very bottom of Iowa, but mainly this is this is a monarch. This is a plant, a milkweed of Texas, Oklahoma, southern Kansas, southern Missouri, Arkansas, Louisiana. Uh, green antelope horn milkweed, Asclepias viridis. And here is a range map. Uh, this is the most important. Um, milkweed <clears throat> for monarchs in the springtime, in early spring, that is, March and April, early May. Uh, a southeastern specialty is sandhill milkweed. It occurs primarily in Florida and adjacent states. Here it is. Uh, I got to first work on the species back in 92. Uh, monarchs love it. Monarch caterpillars love it. Um, really attractive, really different. It grows in extremely dry areas. Uh, and in that same part of the country, we have aquatic milkweed, which, as, it name, as its name suggests, lives in the water uh, or in swamps. But you'll, you'll find it right, right in rivers and creeks. And here it is. It's got beautiful white flowers. And I've seen plenty of monarch caterpillars on it. And this one is shockingly easy to grow. This is actually one of the easiest milkweeds to grow um, in pots. And it will overwinter in pots. So um, great plant uh, to consider adding to your garden if you live in the southern half of the US. <clears throat> Butterfly milkweed is the most widespread of all the milkweeds we've talked about. Um, and one of the most commercially available because it's so pretty. Uh, those brilliant orange flowers are spectacular. Occasionally they're red or yellow. Those are spectacular too. Um, some studies have shown monarchs are less likely to lay eggs on it, but I have seen regions of the country like Northwestern Arkansas and Southern Iowa, where it's the dominant milkweed, monarchs use it very commonly. If you wanna learn more about milkweeds, uh, the Xerces Society and Monarch Joint Venture work together on creating these roadside milkweed guides for every region of the lower 48. Um, I, I helped write the one over to the right, milkweeds in Southeast, to find this. As a free download, just do a Google search for roadside milkweed guides, and this will be the first thing that comes up. <clears throat> and again, we've got something for each part of the lower 48. I apologize that we have not developed these for Canada or Mexico yet. So we talked a lot about milkweeds. Now we want to talk about the nectar. Adults have to have nectar to keep their energy going. What do they like to nectar on? They'll use a variety of plants. They're much less specialized with nectar than the caterpillars are with milkweeds. Uh, the adults will nectar on plants in the aster family, plants in the dogbane family, plants in the mint family, plants in the coffee family, and some other families. But of the thousands and thousands of species of plants in North America, there are only a few that monarchs use really, really often. And some of them they use so often that people call them ice cream, refer to them as ice cream for monarchs or drugs for monarchs um, because uh, monarchs just go to them. They'll, they'll see other flowers, but they'll just go to the, the ones they like the best. 
And if you want to learn about what those plants are to put them in your garden, uh, I have a slide about that later. The most important time of year for nectaring, we think, is in the fall. As the monarchs are heading down to Mexico, they need to fuel up, um, not so much to survive the trip, but mainly to, su to, to survive the winter in Mexico. Where they're going in Mexico is cool. Uh, it's typically not cold, it's not hot, it's cool, but they're not doing much there. And very importantly, <clears throat> Dr. Alfonso Alonso back in the 90s discovered there's nowhere near enough nectar plants near the Mexican overwintering colonies. For those monarchs to have the energy they need to survive for three or four months down in Mexico, they need, they need to fatten up on their way south. So it's really, really important that we have nectar plants in the fall for our monarchs. And if you wanna learn more about milkweeds and nectar plants, consider purchasing this book. This is the only plug I do for, uh, for, for uh, something that costs money. Um, and that is 100 Plants to Feed the Monarch, which is a wonderful book that we produced a few years featuring um, some of the most important milkweeds in the country and the most important native nectar plants in the country. And it covers the whole lower 48. And this book won an award from the American Horticultural Society uh, last year. So it, it's a good one. So where are most of the Eastern monarchs right now? Uh, we're recording this on December 7th, 2023. Um, where are most of the Eastern monarchs in East in, in early December? Well, I bet most of you knew that they are down in Mexico, specifically in Michoacan, their region just west of Mexico City. And very specifically, they're at high elevations in the Oyamel fir forests um, at, uh, on mountaintops, um, a, a couple hours drive west of Mexico City. Uh, this is a photo I took at one of the sites called Sierra Chinqua. Uh, this, this to me was the most picturesque site. The, the views there were spectacular. The day I was there um, was a little late that year and most of the monarchs had already left but I did see thousands and it was pretty special. Uh, the monarchs are also at this colony, El Rosario, which every single year is, has the most monarchs of any colony in Mexico. Um, some years it has tens of millions of monarchs. Uh, it is spectacular. Uh, and, and these are photos that I took in March, 2019. Uh, the monarchs were still there uh, in good numbers. Many had already left to fly north, but it was really, really spectacular. <clears throat> How long do monarchs live? That's a common question people ask. Butterflies in general live only for a few weeks. They die of old age, usually within about a month. And that's true for monarchs during the breeding season, as you can see on the left. <clears throat> but in this little, little box on the right, I point out, that monarchs that fly to Mexico to spend the winter live up to nine months, which is absolutely amazing. Again, the great majority of butterfly species in the world, the adult butterflies live for only a few weeks. <laughs> How can they live that long? From what researchers have discovered, they die young in part because their reproductive hormones are raging during the breeding season. But in late summer and early fall, cues like declining day length, environmental cues, trigger the monarch to turn off its reproductive hormones and trigger it to start migrating to Mexico. <clears throat> when it's down in Mexico, it's not doing nearly as much as it did when it was uh, up in the US and Canada. And it doesn't have the reproductive hormones. So um, it doesn't burn through energy nearly as rapidly and it lives a long time. <clears throat> so let's um, take a look at some, oh, I forgot. Before they leave Mexico, and they leave Mexico usually in late February, early March, mid-March, <laughs> before they leave, 
they mate uh, so that the female uh, is able to lay eggs as it flies north from Mexico. <laughs> so this is, to me, one of the funnest parts of this talk. The migration maps from Journey North, and, and I want to make sure to give Journey North a lot of credit here. Journey North is a nonprofit organization that um, records data that people, community scientists, anybody who wants to, can report data on monarchs they see or on other natural phenomena that they see. You can report it at the Journey North website, journeynorth.org. They're looking for special certain things. They're looking for data on tulips. When do the tulips bloom? And, and <clears throat> when do the monarchs um, arrive in your city? Things like that. <clears throat> this map shows where monarchs were March 7th, 2017. Uh, where were they? Well, the great majority of them were down in Mexico. But interestingly enough, there were some along the Gulf Coast. And that's important to know. But again, the overwhelming majority were down in Mexico, of course. The Western population was out on the California coast. We're not going to talk about them anymore. <clears throat> so what happens between March 7th and April 4th, the monarchs have left the overwintering colonies and they enter Texas. And some of them lay eggs in Texas and stay. Some of them go to North Texas and lay eggs. Some of them go to Oklahoma and lay eggs. It looks like one made it all the way to um, St. Louis. Um, and a few make it to Arkansas, Louisiana, uh, Mississippi, places like that. <laughs> Excuse me. But pretty certain that the overwhelming majority of those monarchs that spent the winter in Mexico lay eggs in Texas, and then they die. Their, their eight or nine months of life is done. However, their offspring fly north. Their offspring hatch, uh, become caterpillars, become pupae, and become adults around, around May 1st on average, and they head north, laying eggs as they go. Uh, June 6th, we're still seeing that same generation, which we refer to the ref as the first generation. They've just some of the individuals have gone even farther and have made it all the way to Saskatchewan and Manitoba and Ontario and Quebec and Nova Scotia. Um, yeah, I do believe that is Nova Scotia. So it's the first generation that really, um, you know, the, the overwintering generation goes from Mexico to Texas and Oklahoma, but it's the first generation of monarchs that really uh, goes a lot farther through the US and Canada, goes northward. That first generation lays eggs and their offspring of course become the second generation, which you would see uh, in late June and July. And you'd have a third generation and a fourth generation typically, but they don't move northward much at all. Now, this is the same year, this map is depicting monarchs in the same year but I, I, I took the map off the website at different times, so the color pattern changed. But it's the same year, I promise you. Uh, you can see that in early August of 2017, most of the monarchs seen were up north. And that is truly the case. A few were seen down south, but as a longtime southerner, I know that monarchs are pretty hard to find in July and early August down south. Much more common up north. Well, those northern monarchs start to get the urge to migrate. Uh, and by early September, um, people are reporting large numbers of monarchs migrating through the northern states. <clears throat> That's early September. By early October, that migration has moved quite a way south, down through Kansas, Oklahoma, and even into Texas. Uh, early October, for me as a monarch lover, it's my favorite time of the year because living in Oklahoma, that's when the monarchs show up. So I try to never leave home, never leave Oklahoma in early October because it's an amazing time to see monarchs here. Uh, they're also migrating down the East Coast and down the Appalachians. By late October, monarchs have already made it through Texas and into Northern Mexico. 
And by Halloween, well, Halloween is usually when the first monarchs show up at the overwintering colonies in Michoacan. Other monarchs are still slowly making their way down the East Coast or across on the Gulf Coast. But that is how the migration works. That is the pattern of the migration. Those monarchs uh, in November, monarchs continue coming south from Texas, uh, Louisiana, South Carolina, flying toward Mexico, spending the winter there in these amazing overwintering colonies. And I'm checking the time quickly. Um, so I want to get back to this slide. March 7th, 2017, of course, most of the monarchs were down in Michoacan, Mexico, but these red triangles showed there were monarchs hanging out down here in the winter. What's up with that? Well, this is a topic that I think is in need, in great need of further study. We've known for decades that some monarchs spend the winter on in the Gulf Coast, but we didn't know how many. We thought not that many, and it, we still don't have evidence that there are lots of them down there. However, <clears throat> this wonderful study was published this year by Michael Kendrick and Billy McCord in a very high profile journal, Nature, uh, in which they reveal their findings that monarchs overwinter on the South Carolina coast. It's really exciting news. This is something I had no idea about five years ago. I did learn about it uh, three years ago because I started communicating with Billy McCord, the person who discovered this, and he, he filled me in on it. And I find his research extremely fascinating. Billy, uh, called by a lot of people in the South Carolina coast, called Monarch Man, has captured and tagged over 50,000 monarchs in South Carolina. I don't think I've talked about tagging yet. For some of you, that's a, a totally new topic. Tagging is where you put a sticker. You put a little sticky sticker on a monarch wing and each sticker has a special ID number for that butterfly so that if somebody else finds that sticker, um, uh, it also has an email address. They can email the email address and say, hey, I found butterfly one, two, three, ABC. Uh, I found this in my backyard in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Tell me where was it tagged? So that's what the tagging is all about. Well, he tagged over 50,000 monarchs, which is a lot. And between 1996 and 2019, he captured over 5,000 monarchs in the winter on the South Carolina coast. Amazingly, of his 50,000 monarchs that he tagged, only three have been found in Michoacan, Mexico, but eight have been recovered in Florida. Even though very few people in Florida are looking for tagged monarchs. In Michoacan, Mexico, people are paid $5 for each tagged monarch, tagged monarch they find. In Florida, nobody's paying anybody for tagged monarchs. So this tells me that there's a good possibility that monarchs migrating down the southeastern coast, that many of them are not even trying to get to Mexico. They may be trying to go to Florida or to Cuba or to points beyond. And this brings me up to the fine research of my dear friend, Dr. Christina Dox, who uh, discovered uh, decades ago that uh, some monarchs do indeed migrate to Cuba from New York, Canada, Virginia, down to Cuba. Uh, and she has a more recent paper uh, in which she um, produces findings that some of them are flying down into the Yucatan and to Guatemala. So uh, very exciting stuff. While the overwhelming majority of monarchs in the fall are heading to Mexico, some, we don't know how many, are heading to alternate locations. And that's something I find very fascinating. Um, so this map that we at the Xerxes Society has produced showing that there's no migration of monarchs through South Florida, this might need to get edited in the future because it does seem uh, through Dox, Dr. Dox's work that there is movement through Florida to Canada, uh, but also through a, a study by um, Vander, Vander Zanden and all in which they found that half of the monarchs 
that they captured in Miami had actually come from, from the north. They, they studied uh, the chemicals in the monarchs, the isotopes specifically, and were able to figure out that these monarchs that they caught in Miami had originated in places like Illinois and Michigan, uh, not the Miami area. So pretty fascinating stuff in my opinion. So how can you learn more about these amazing creatures? We've got a free download. Uh, we've got a lot of free downloads, but here's one all about monarchs, uh, a wonderful 35-page uh, publication titled The Conservation Status and Ecology of the Monarch Butterfly in the U.S. Um, this was the lead author is uh, the head of our endangered species program at Xerces. And um, just do a Google search and you'll find it for free. Uh, I strongly recommend that you visit Journey North's monarch maps uh, and that you contribute your own data, your own observations to Journey North. Uh, I do, and I find it very rewarding. And it's a great way to learn where the monarchs are and what they're doing. Monarch Joint Venture uh, is a conservation nonprofit. Uh, they have lots of great downloads and links to terrific uh, fact sheets. Uh, and of course, they have the webinar series that I mentioned earlier. Monarch Watch another monarch conservation nonprofit based in Lawrence, Kansas, um, has uh, wonderful programs. They are the folks who create the monarch tags, the little stickers that we put on butterflies, the little stickers that have enabled us to figure out uh, how we are monarchs from the US and Canada migrate in the fall. Uh, they also have programs in which they give away milkweeds or they sell milkweeds. Uh, here's an example of a monarch tag. Um, seeing this really warms my heart because this is a butterfly, uh, a monarch uh, that um, me and my friend Tanya captured in Florida. And it had been tagged by Millie, Billy McCord, the gentleman in South Carolina. So um, uh, we, were, we were able to uh, communicate with Billy and he said yes. I tagged that butterfly in South Carolina in October, and we found it in Florida in December. Pretty clear proof that that butterfly had, had migrated from South Carolina to spend the winter in Florida. Another great product of Monarch Watch is the Dplex email listserv. This is if you want to get emails every day with the nitty gritty about monarch biology. For some people, this is just too much. If it's too much for you, you can always cancel it. It's free. It's free to sign up. It's free to participate. It's free to cancel. But I find this fascinating. Uh, this gentleman here who posted, Orly Taylor, also known as Chip, is the founder of Monarch Watch, the founder of Dplex, just about the most knowledgeable person on earth, along with Dr. Karen Oberhauser and Anurag Agarwal, uh, regarding monarchs these days. So it's, it's a wonderful way to learn more about monarchs. We have nectar plant lists at our website that we produced along with Monarch Joint Venture. If you wanna learn more about the flowers that monarchs like. And I have extreme interest in what flowers monarchs like because I am the administrator of the Xerces Society's Monarch Nectar Plant Database. Uh, here's a, a snap of what it looks like. Basically, it's observations by you and your friends and colleagues all across America and soon Canada and Mexico. Uh, it tells us these, these are your observations of when you saw monarchs visiting a flower and where you saw it and what flower it was. So if you've ever seen a monarch visit a wildflower, we want your data. I want your data. So um, please strongly consider taking a photo right now of that QR code on the screen. And that'll take you to a website where you can enter data. I'll leave this up for a little bit so you can get your phone out and take a, snap a picture, please, please. It would really help me out if you take a picture of this QR code and go to the website. <laughs> Website's gonna look like this. And in about five minutes, you, you would enter data 
on what flower you saw a monarch on. It's going to ask you for a photo at the end of the monarch. Here's a little tip. Put any photo of a monarch you can find. If you have a, any photo of a monarch that you've ever taken or a photo off the web, just put it there. Um, we require a photo. We want, we want to be sure that you know how to identify monarchs. But if you've watched this presentation, you know how to identify monarchs. So put on any photo of a monarch you can find from anywhere. Or if you have data on monarchs and you don't want to go through that portal, please email me. So, oh, finally, if you have additional questions about monarchs, uh, please email us your questions at monarchs at xerces.org. You can connect with us uh, on Facebook. Um, I'm going to call it Twitter and Instagram. The takeaway messages of this talk, as I hope you've realized, is that monarchs are truly amazing creatures. There's still a lot we don't understand about them, including their migration. But through community science programs, you can contribute a lot to our knowledge of monarch biology. I want to thank Rachel for inviting me to speak today and for hosting this webinar. And of course, I want to thank the supporters of the Xerces Society, uh, most especially members of the Xerces Society. Thank you to any Xerces Society members watching today. If you're not a Xerces Society member, excuse me, please consider to join the movement. Um, our work depends on everyone. Uh, you can really make a difference by contributing to our organization to help us um, do our work out in the field. We're, 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 we're truly making it happen. We're collecting data, we're planting plants, we're helping other people plant milkweeds and nectar plants. Um, we're helping to protect uh, habitat from, uh, from pesticide pollution. We're doing a lot of good work out there. We'd love it if you would consider uh, going to that website and donating today. Are there any questions? Hi, Ray. Yes, thank you for that. We have a lot of really good questions, so I'm just going to jump right into them. Um, we have a few people asking, can you go back to the QR code slide? Oh, I think. Of course. For, oh, I'm so glad to, to use that. Yeah, a few people. There we go. Let's, let's, let's just keep it there. <laughs> um, lots of great feedback in the chat as well. So for folks who haven't been looking at the chat, I've been including links to almost all these resources. And I just put in a link to our Monarch Nectar plant lists as well. Um, so lots of good resources on our website. And thank you, Ray, um, for all of those. So yeah, let's just start up here at the beginning. Lots of great questions. And someone did, by the way, Ray, say that they were in the highlands of Guatemala and saw monarchs and had no idea <laughs> uh, if they were the same monarch. So that's really exciting. It's possible that they were not. Okay. There is a different subspecies of monarch that spends the full year in Central America, uh, in Guatemala. Uh, I believe it's called Danaeus plexippus megalippi, mm -hmm. whereas the one that I talked about today is Danaeus plexippus plexippus. But um, a trained eye, not mine, but a trained eye can tell the difference. So the ones in the highlands of Guatemala, actually, could you email me, please? I would love to find out exactly where you saw that. Uh, I mean, that's very important data. And I'm I'm not I'm not exaggerating. I'm not kidding. Um, I would very much love uh, my my colleague Christina Docks, who I mentioned, who discovered that monarchs go to Cuba. She, she's looking into them going to Guatemala as well. So we would love your data. Um, love to know where you saw those monarchs. It's possible they were migrants. It's possible that they that they are fully a residents of Guatemala. All right, I'm sending them a specific chat with your email address. <laughs> oh, awesome. All right, perfect. Okay, so a few few questions. Mike is wondering, does artificial light at night have any impact on migrating monarch butterflies? And if so, what is that impact? It's a good question. It is a good question. Um, I do not, I am not certain of the answer. <clears throat> My, I suspect the answer is primarily no, because they don't migrate at night. They 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 uh, start 
as as it gets cooler and 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 the sun goes down, they start coming down out of the sky, and they roost in typically in trees or or any any structures they can find. If they're out in prairie, they'll they'll roost in the prairie vegetation. Um, yeah, given the fact that they're not migrating at night, the birds many birds migrate at night, but monarch butterflies uh, typically uh, overwhelmingly, I believe, migrate during the day. So I don't think those um, now could those lights be having some impact on them while they're roosting and sleeping, perhaps, but to my knowledge, that hasn't been studied. All right, another question. How are milkweed alkaloids retained in the body of the monarch adults after passing through the metamorphosis stages? Mm -hmm. um, I can't answer that. Um, I, um, even though I've, I've read plenty of papers related to that topic, because I studied, studied cardiac glycosides for my master's degree, uh, and, and, I, uh, and, and I counted how many cardiac glycosides were in queens and queen butterflies and monarchs, um, how they, how they, how you know, are they in the blood? Are they in the tissue? Uh, I think to some degree they're in the wings. So they, I certainly have read that they're, that they, that they, um, that they accumulate in certain tissues more than others. But, but the mechanism by which those chemicals uh, bind to, uh, to cells and tissues uh, in the monarch, I do not understand. Excellent question. Does the scientific community know? I feel like that would be really hard to. <laughs> I think I think the work of doc, Dr. Anurag Agrawal at Cornell University. I think in his papers, I think he's probably he's probably figured it out. It's probably in some of his papers, but he he's written a lot of papers, and I haven't read. I've only read a handful of them, but uh, he's he's to my knowledge currently the the premier expert on cardiac glycosides uh, in monarchs. Okay. Lots of good, hard questions from the audience today. Yeah. All right, William, uh, this is actually, I'm really glad this is brought up because we were just talking about this in one of our podcasts about what an endangered species is, but they read that the monarch is now considered an endangered species is under federal protection. However, the feds say they do not have the money to protect it. Can you, maybe we can plant milkweed. I think that was their comment, but do you have any um, comments or feedback on that of what he said about yes. the federal yes. <laughs> So a few years ago, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, which is the federal agency that um, puts species on the endangered species list. And I used to work for them many years ago, 20 years ago, it was, a, it was good work. Um, they said the monarch is, is in enough trouble that it deserves to be listing. It, it merits being listed, but we don't have enough time to list it now because we've got so many other things that are higher priority. So many other species that we've looked reviewed and they need listing too. So, um, so they said, hey, in a few years, we will, we will get back to it and we will likely list the monarch. As a, as a threatened species, not as endangered. Still, uh, two different two different classes within the Endangered Species Act, but it'll still get a fair amount of federal protection if it is listed as threatened. Um, so that's that's the answer to that portion. Uh, I think the second part of the question is, what should they plant to help monarchs? Was that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just oh, plant yeah. milkweed, which you talked about a lot. <laughs> plant milkweeds, plant nectar plants. Uh, if you're in the South, especially Oklahoma and Texas, it's more important that you plant nectar plants than milkweeds. Milkweed, it's if you, ideally if you can plant both, plant both. But uh, in the deep South, in in South Central U.S., Oklahoma, Texas, our studies have shown, including a study I'm an author on, that we probably have a lot more milkweeds down here than there are in some of the northern states. Um, but uh, we're working on a paper right now in which we're finding that the nectar plants, well, not as many as we hoped. So we need more nectar plants. But yes, plant milkweeds and nectar plants. Mm -hmm. All right. And then this actually goes very <laughs> nicely with that last um, comment you made. 
this person lives in Oregon and they know that it's best to only plant natives, but there is some re research to indicate that milkweed species are not native um, to a given monarch population, or sorry, there is research to indicate that milkweed species, maybe not native milkweed species can still be helpful for monarch populations. Is this true or not true for Eastern or Western populations? Do they pose it? There's a lot of acrimony about that. That's being debated. Um, <clears throat> I, I think uh, one of the researchers, who, uh, and, and I'm a fan of his work in general, uh, is in the Pacific Northwest, uh, uh, Professor David James in Washington. Uh, I think he is a proponent of tropical milkweed. We at the Xerces Society are not. Um, we know that monarchs like it. Um, we know that monarchs have been using tropical milkweed as a host plant in South America and Central America and, and the Caribbean probably for thousands and thousands of years. But we have concerns about the use of tropical milkweed uh, here in the US. Um, and we have, a, we have a website devoted to that. Um, so so, so that's, that's our point of view. We, we, we really want people to go with the native milkweeds uh, instead of tropical milkweed, uh, but um, in the overwhelming majority of the U.S., it's 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 your choice. It's up to you. Um, I've grown tropical milkweed in the past before I had this position, and 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 indeed, monarch caterpillars uh, did well on it. Um, and as an nectar source, it's fantastic too. Um, but um, we do have concerns about um, tro tropical milkweed being harmful in the in the long run. Yeah, especially in California where they're supposed to be overwintering, then they don't overwinter when they see the tropical milkweed. So I just know that's like a particular hot spot where you don't want to plant tropical. But um, someone did find a paper on light pollution in monarchs, which is really interesting and talking about it, um, reducing its evening rest cycle. So I just put that in the chat. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, I'm downloading it right now. I hope it's just that that <laughs> On to the next question. Do monarchs live in Florida and Cuba year round? Are um, you are presumably looking at tagged monarchs in this research? Um, excuse me. <laughs> I got a phone call. I didn't mean for that. Okay. Are monarchs in Florida year round? That is a very complicated question. Mm -hmm. uh, I had thought. Uh, as of a couple of years ago, I lived in North Florida for 10 years and we had uh, very few, mon we had monarchs in spring and fall and very few in summer and we thought none in winter. Um, in South Florida, we thought there were monarchs all year round. Uh, from doing more research into it in the last few weeks, I'm learning that even in South Florida, they don't have that many in the summer mm -hmm. from, from the people I've consulted. So it seems like they are arriving there. We know they have them there all winter and they have them in spring and they show up in fall, but not that many in the summer, which implies to me that it is not, that, that it's a very complicated situation in South Florida, that there are probably some there all summer, but the population is getting boosted by migrants coming through in the fall and possibly by migrants coming through in, in the spring coming up from Cuba and the Caribbean. Uh, that part is really not well demonstrated, I don't think, but it's something that we that that uh, Dr. Docs uh, will be looking to 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 prove. Neat question. Yeah. What about year round in Cuba, or do we year know? round in Cuba? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, uh, I know who to contact about that, but I, I don't have the answer to that. Um, I do believe there there are some year round in in Central America, um, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, in, in in Guatemala. So, uh, but Cuba, I'm not sure. Great question. Okay. All right, next question. Uh, if monarch caterpillars, this is a good question. Very, uh, thank you. The anonymous person that asked this. If monarch caterpillars and our backyard milkweed are getting eaten up by predators, is it okay to bring them inside and feed them leaves inside a butterfly tent or is this not helpful? So many, many people have done that. Uh, I have done that. It does usually increase the survival rate of the caterpillars because it protects them from the predators. 
but we do, we as Xerxes have major concerns about bringing them inside. If you wanna protect your monarchs, your monarch eggs, caterpillars and pupae from predators. Um, and that's something these days I don't, I don't do. I let nature take its course because you know, the, the flies and the ants, um, the wasps, they need to eat too. But if you wanna protect them, consider having a cage outside. Recent, recent research has shown that when you bring them inside, the lack of natural light uh, can screw up their ability to migrate later on. Um, also, the big fear we have is when you have them inside, um, if you had them in containers, which one could do, uh, researchers will put monarchs in tiny little cups, monarch caterpillars. Uh, we did this 30 years ago as part of my research. We raised hundreds and hundreds on a single table, each one in its own little cup. Um, there's great risk of disease breakouts when you when you have lots of monarchs, monarch caterpillars in close proximity. Um, when we did that research 30 years ago, it was my job to sterilize every single cup, uh, I believe with alcohol or something like that, to kill to kill the microbes. It was a lot of work. So uh, um, we do think we as Xerxes think it's better to keep them outside. Um, try not to bring them inside. If you were to bring them inside, which we don't recommend definitely uh, keep things as sanitary as possible because we are worried about uh, disease breakouts. Thank you, Ray. Mm -hmm. uh, Wendy is wondering if the discovery of monarchs traveling to Cuba, Guatemala, and the Yucatan, is that new that they just started migrating there or is that because we're doing more research? That's a fantastic question too. Um, according to my friend, Christina, um, a few people have known about it for decades. Um, and, 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 and Christina's publication is very recent. Uh, um, and, and, you know, we don't have lots of numbers here. We're talking about people seeing dozens of monarchs or hundreds of monarchs uh, in one year and, and not as many the next. So again, the populations we think much, much, much smaller. But yes, it has been known. There are reports uh, from decades ago of people seeing this. So I don't think it's a new phenomenon. There are reports from the 1800s of monarchs spending the winter in Florida. I just found, uh, Christina and, and my friend Tanya and I just found some of these a few weeks ago and shared them. And it was so so exciting that in like 1885, people, people um, found monarchs spending the winter in Orlando, Florida. So. So the person, oh, sorry. The person who mentioned that they saw monarchs in Guatemala is wondering what Christina's last name is. Uh, I, I had it up as one of the slides. D-O-C-K-X, Docs. Christina is from Colombia, uh, but her dad was Belgian. And like many Belgians, she has the C-K-X at the end of, end of her last name. Um, she's, she would, she would, Christina uh, and I would, Absolutely love to hear about your observation in Guatemala. Lots of people are asking for your email address, so. <laughs> um, so Lisa, one of our ambassadors actually in Canada is wondering if she can start entering data on nectar plants or is that for the future for the database? Please start right away. Now, it, it Lisa, it's Lisa, right? Mm -hmm. Lisa, I apologize in that the database looks like it's designed only for Americans because there's a pull down menu to indicate what state from you're from, but there's also, a, you can also go to the map and indicate where you saw the monarch on the map. So just put a dot on the map and that dot's gonna be in Canada. And I, we don't have any data from Canada yet. I would love for your data to be our very first data point from Canada. Uh, I'm so embarrassed that I haven't, that we haven't gotten data from Canada yet. Or Mexico, that will change. That's changing today. <laughs> I have some data from Mexico, so I'm going to enter it today. And Lisa, if you'll enter your data from Canada, um, that'll be the beginning of a good thing. Uh, I, I don't think you'll have any problem entering your data uh, from wherever you saw it, Canada. All right. Uh, this is a fun question. Tina is wondering is the Meadow blazing star or the ice cream plant 
call that because it coincides with their migration south, at least here in Minnesota, or because it is an excellent nectar source. <laughs> uh, both, both. Uh, so that plant, which I still haven't seen, but I've heard about, I'm gonna go ahead and be a little crazy and give you what people really call it. They don't call it the ice cream, ice cream plant. They call it crack cocaine for monarch butterflies. Monarchs love it so much that they're addicted to it. Um, it's um, uh, it's a very beautiful plant, as you know. I've seen it in pictures, and I've seen photos of hundreds and hundreds of monarchs nectaring on that plant. There are other blazing stars that they like a lot, but apparently that one has got just a little sweeter or a little tastier, and uh, it's got something special that uh, makes them really devoted to that plant. Uh, I did get a question from someone asking, because of their migration uh, to Cuba, I'm assuming, wondering if monarchs could fly over large bodies of water, or maybe that they got to Hawaii somehow, that kind of made them think that. Their, uh, monarchs have, have spread to Australia, to Hawaii, to parts of Spain, England. I think in many cases they were carried over. But they, you know, um, I don't think they like to fly over large bodies of water. Um, but but the, the, the colleagues I have in Latin America say they see them flying. People have seen them in Cozumel, which is an island off of Cancun, Mexico. They have seen them flying over the Gulf from the direction of Cuba. So they will occasionally by choice, fly over significant bodies of water. Um, and of course, if they get caught in a hurricane, then maybe they're carried hundreds of miles by a hurricane, possibly birds, that happens with birds, maybe that happens with monarchs. Um, so I, I think in general, they'd really rather not fly across large bodies of water, but some of them uh, very clearly seem to be doing it. That's really incredible. <laughs> with birds, it seems, you know, crazy enough, but with a little monarch. <laughs> <clears throat> um, we have another question about tropical milkweed specifically. Um, <clears throat> this person heard that planting non-native tropical milkweed along with the issue about the virus OE, more likely to be transmitted via caterpillars raised on tropical milkweed, that the plant's lack of dormancy in November and December is causing monarchs to stay too long in Texas where they live. Could people planting non-native tropical milkweed be keeping the monarchs staying too long and potentially getting hit by hit during a freeze instead of reaching safely in Mexico, safety in Mexico? Yes, that that is very possible. And, and many people, many scientists who study uh, the, the parasite OE, um, OE uh, is short. Uh, it's an acronym or abbreviation for Ophiocystis electroscira. It's a protozoan, not a virus, but a protozoan parasite. Tiny little, uh, uh, it, it, it has tiny uh, black, tiny microscopic black spores uh, that cause disease in monarchs. And uh, the disease can be fatal, usually isn't, but it, 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 it can definitely reduce the health of adult monarchs significantly. Uh, yes, there's there are plenty of papers showing there's, um, as the questioner asked, um, plenty of papers suggesting that tropical milkweed can be a major threat. And that's one of the major reasons why we at Xerces do not promote it. Um, there are some other researchers who say, hey, um, we disagree with that, even, even though uh, that milkweed has OE, there are other milkweeds that have OE, but <clears throat> But uh, currently, that is the, the one of the main concerns that we have at the Xerces Society about planting tropical milkweed, especially down south. Uh, up in Minnesota, probably not as much of an issue. It, I'm certain it's not as much of an issue. It all gets killed. It's um, When I've grown it in the past here in Oklahoma, it gets winter killed at uh, about 28 degrees Fahrenheit. Minnesota gets a lot colder than that. All right, Wendy has a question about your nectar plant reporting database. Is it just native plants that you would like or can they be cultivars of native plants? 
Yes, it can be cultivars and native plants. We do prefer native plants. Um, some people have report, reported exotic plants, and that's okay, but we, we do prefer native plants or secondly, cultivars of native plants. That, that's useful too. Please, please send your data our way. Oh, you'll like this question. Uh, Mary had a monarch pupae in their yard two weeks ago in Tulsa. If they hatch during this time of year, what is likely to happen to them? Nectar is a hit or miss at this time mm -hmm. of year. Phenomenal question. So um, I know a Mary in Tulsa. I wonder if it's the same one. Um, Mary Guard. I, oh, yes, I know that. I, I know two Marys in Tulsa then. Hey, Mary. <laughs> um, nice, to, nice to see you again. Um, I live, uh, as Mary knows, I live um, 60 miles west of Tulsa. So what, what happens in Tulsa would pretty much happen here. Uh, that monarch pupa probably came out as a butterfly. And that butterfly would have very few flowers to visit, at least here in Stillwater. So I think that butterfly probably started wandering south. Has it made it to Mexico? Almost certainly not. Will it make it to Mexico? The studies show probably not. But maybe it'll spend the, uh, a couple months in Texas. Maybe it'll find some tropical milkweeds down in Houston. Maybe, maybe it'll go down into northern Mexico and find some native milkweeds. Who knows? Um, but it's probably still, a, there's a good chance it's still alive. Monarchs are actually quite tough. They're tougher regarding cold than I used to think, um, than, than I knew. And it turns out there was a study done decades ago showing that um, they can tolerate some of them can tolerate temperatures down in the teens. Now, once you get below about 15 degrees, just about all of them die. But they can certainly, many of them will survive temperatures in the 20s. They're, they're to, uh, that is Fahrenheit. Great question, Mary. Small world. Yeah. Uh, William, if you're still on the webinar, if you could just throw in the chat where you're located. They're asking that they see monarchs in late October that lay eggs. And they are assuming that this is at least the third or fourth generation. Maybe you can answer this question without knowing um, their location. It's very possible it's the fourth generation. Well, you, you, you never really know, but it's certainly possible that it be the fourth generation. It's also possible that it be the fifth or even the sixth generation. Um, most people up north don't know about a fifth generation. That's more of a phenomenon down here in the deep south. Because in September, remember the monarchs are leaving Minnesota and New York and Canada heading south. Well, we have some monarchs that just start arriving here in September. Mm -hmm. We're not sure where they're from. And they breed like crazy. Mm -hmm. They lay their eggs like crazy. And I had, I, I, here in Oklahoma, I had caterpillars um, in October. So uh, yes, those are fifth generation. Those could be fifth generation or maybe uh, even sixth generation monarchs, which is pretty wild to think about. Especially if you if you see monarch cat, uh, caterpillars or pupae in November, those could be the sixth generation, which is neat. They are yeah, in the tropics. They have 12 generations, right? Every month, a new generation they, they could have. So yeah. but, uh, we have, we down in the South, we have, we can have more than four generations. Okay. It looks like um, William is in Rich Richmond, Virginia. That's pretty late for Richmond, but, but not, not, not shocking, not shocking given the data I've seen on the Journey North website. Uh, I've seen people report seeing monarchs in Massachusetts in November. Uh, now, those monarchs probably are not going to have a very long life. They're probably, uh, it's going to get too cold for them unless they head south really fast. But um, yes, William and Virginia, that, that monarch very possibly was a fifth generation monarch. All right, we have time for just maybe one or two more questions. Uh, this is another one from Mary, and I'm asking because I'm curious as well. I have not ever lived anywhere with monarchs except Hawaii. In Hawaii, <laughs> everywhere else I've lived in, in Oregon, Maine, here in Montana, we don't get a lot of monarchs. Um, but they're wondering what the gold material is on monarch pupae, and I have no idea what that gold material is, and I've never seen it. So I want to ask it. Thank you, Mary, for asking that question. I've seen it. It looks like liquid gold. <laughs> it's fantastically beautiful. 
but I don't know what it is. Um, I, I, I don't know what makes it gold. Uh, I bet some people do know because it is so beautiful, but I can't answer that. Um, but yes, every every monarch pupa has a uh, has a ring around the top that's sort of got some like black speckling and then some gold little little um, very beautiful, very very it looks like liquid gold. Oh well. <laughs> I hope you get to see it, Rachel. I know I have to be on the hunt whenever I travel. I'll have to make sure I look ahead of time and see if there's monarch caterpillars at that time. All right. Well, we have time for one more question. We're going a little over today. Thanks everyone for hanging on with us. Um, Heather is wondering how we can prevent OE from being spread throughout monarch populations. Huh. OE is a natural, you know, parasite of monarchs. It's been associated with monarchs probably for thousands of years. Um, it is native to monarchs in North America. But yes, we don't we don't want them we don't want the incidence rate to, to get higher. Uh, so I do think uh, avoiding tropical milkweed is a good idea. If you do grow tropical milkweed, here's a simple tip. Cut it back uh, late in the year so that it doesn't um, um, harbor OE in the fall and have migrating monarchs pick it up and get contaminated with it. I think the thing to think uh, the, the thing to know about tropical milkweed, it's not magical. It doesn't have some magical property of making OE really happy, except the fact that it lives for a really long time in a given year, uh, unless it gets really cold. Uh, so in the South, a tropical milkweed that you plant in April, maybe it has some monarch larvae in April, uh, and some and, and maybe some adult lands on it in April and get some OE on it, that OE might stay on that plant all the way in, through the next winter if you're the deep south. Mm -hmm. uh, that can happen on native milkweeds too, but it's less likely because the native milkweeds, most of them go dormant for some period, but not all of them. So native milkweeds have OE too, but a good idea is to cut back the um, the tropical milkweed. I would think it might be smart to cut it back before the fall migration. Um, I can't remember if that's our guideline, certainly before winter, but maybe even before fall. All right. Um, Paula, let me know in the chat that there's a group of researchers in Germany. They carefully study the properties of those gold spots. <laughs> and they're not metallic, so they aren't really gold. But the cells reflect light like metals do, giving them the appearance of being metallic. And other closely related caterpillars can do this as well with um, silver or copper spots. That's so interesting. Thank you, Paula. It is fascinating. I've actually seen pupae of some butterfly species related marks. The entire surface is gold. The entire surface of the pupa looks like liquid gold. Really, really phenomenal. But no, I had never spent the time to figure out what that was. Thank you, Paula, for for uh, doing the the literature research for us. Yes, thank you so much for that. 